Welcome back to Believe in Colts. I'm Lawrence Owen. With me, as usual, is my guy, Gerard Powers. And today, we're going to go ahead and break down the best of the best for the Indianapolis Colts, all-time greats, you know, for each position. I think this is something that, you know, I personally have not sat down and done myself, made a list out like this. Um, Gerard probably hasn't either. I'm obviously... You know, conversations pass, you know, when you're talking to your friends or or other sports heads or something, you know, talking about all time greats and stuff, but uh, not necessarily sit down and make a list out. Right. I mean, right, that's, right. Um, so ain't talked to you in about a week. Gerard, how, how's your week been? Uh, we've been good. i uh, been on daddy duty. Wife been out of town for work. So, um, you know, been dealing with all the craziness of the kids, but. You know, positive attitude, looking forward to it, having a good time. How about you? No, it's, it's been pretty good. The weather's been pretty fair uh, sitting here in in Indiana. And uh, my wife's been putting out those uh, uh, stained glass items uh, yep. at, a, at a better clip now that she's got some of the materials that she needs. But nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I've been waiting all week. Uh, honestly, I was, we've been, I, I've been kind of brainstorming going, what am I going to talk about? The training camp's still a couple weeks away. <laughs> but, you know, this, this seems like a pretty good, pretty good topic to go over. Um, so let's, talking about all-time greats yeah. and talking, and talking about, um, you know, Who's going to be next on that list? And when you think about that, you think about, oh, my goodness. Hey, you know what? I got to make my team. Oh, crap. Now I got to bet. Betting. What? Betting. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source of all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including NBA Summer League, Major League Bas Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get the bonus and get into the action. Bet online, where the game starts. That was an absolute awful transition to that. I am sorry, Bet online. I'm sorry, those of you watching and listening. Uh, but it was off the top of my head. Because uh, <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot about it, and I can't do that. <laughs> so Gerard, let's go ahead and start this off with the obvious answers. Um mm -hmm. obviously on offense, the the biggest obvious answer uh, I could be wrong, but quarterback, right? Would would that not be the most obvious answer on who the greatest quarterback the Indianapolis Colts have ever had is? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a a, a a hard answer or a hard guess for too many people. But obviously, like everybody else know, it's the standard, the guy that set the standard to play the quarterback position, and that is Peyton Manning. Absolutely. I mean, there's a reason why Lucas Oil – I mean – they say, you know, Peyton Manning, Lucas Oil is the, the stadium Peyton Manning got built, right? Uh, he, right. He, and not just on the field as a standard of a player, but off the field as well with all the stuff that he, he has an entire wing in the children's hospital named after him because of his donations and stuff. Just a great person on the field and off the field. What are some things that you uh, could talk about with Peyton Manning being that you had played with him for a number of years? Uh, probably, like I said, just the standard, just his everyday business approach, uh, taking all the little things seriously. Uh, I mean, everything he did, every decision he made, everything he did within that organization was in order to win. You know, that's all he wanted to do was win and try to have the team in the best position to win. And just seeing the inside of that, just how he prepares, uh, how he leads, how he works and obviously how he performs on the field on Sundays, man. It was a it was a pleasure to be a part of just because you always knew you had a shot with 18 as your quarterback, no matter how bad you played. And uh, he was going to make sure that the team is prepared. Uh, so it was fun to be around him. It was fun to see all that type of stuff in real time uh, rather than the highlights on ESPN or the documentaries or whatever the case may be to see it in real time. Uh, I mean, it, it's something that you you have talk about forever uh, just because, I mean, he's 
practice as a quarterback, uh, you know, to, to, to play this game. So it was, it was a, a pleasure to be a part of. All right. Well, talking about um, all-time greats, uh, there are some arguments on a few of the players that we're going to discuss about because we're going to stay on the offense, obviously, and kind of link with Peyton Manning. The Colts have actually, Indianapolis Colts have actually had some pretty darn good players at at, at the same position, right, uh, through right. the tenure uh, here since 1983-84. Um, Peyton Manning threw to a bunch of guys and two of those guys that top the list are on my list. And I actually had to think about it a little bit because I wanted to take my personal, uh, I don't know who I like the most out of it and go, who was the best wide receiver that Peyton Manning was throwing to. And my list now, granted those two guys for me was Reggie Wayne. Marvin Harrison, the two best wide receivers the Indianapolis Colts have ever had, in my opinion. And both of them were very hardworking. Both of them had attention to detail. I'm going to give the edge to Marvin Harrison because his ability to make a catch when you need it in a most improbable and impossible situation was like second to none, in my opinion. What where, where, where do you where do you uh, come down on at wide receiver? Uh, I don't I don't think you can go wrong with either choice. Obviously, I think uh, Marv has you know the 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 records he has more numbers. Obviously, he played longer with Peyton and those things. But um, you know I'm a I'm gonna say Reggie just off of the strength of that's who I played with. That's who I saw go to work every day. That's who I competed uh, competed with against at practice. And uh, seeing him work on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I probably saw him drop maybe two or three balls in four years, you know, in practice, uh, just just seeing it. I mean, it was just some of the most amazing catches, amazing routes that you will ever witness uh, in person. And I heard the same thing about Marv. Uh, I miss Marv. Uh, when I got to Indy, he had just retired, but everybody in Indy raved about how good of a route runner he was, how he never dropped balls, his work ethic, how he practiced, you know, his approach to the game, you know, all of the above. And I think Reggie kind of came into the league under his umbrella to where he can kind of learn the, the format, you know, to success, uh, especially to success with Peyton as your quarterback. So I think Reggie probably took a lot from Marv uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis, his worth ethic, you know, seeing how he does certain things and added it uh, to his own game. But I'm going to personally say Reggie, obviously a friend of mine and a uh, former teammate of mine, but uh, you can't go wrong with Marv. I mean, everything that Marv done uh, as far as as a receiver is a standard as well. I mean, he's always going to be mentioned as one of the greatest of all time. Absolutely. I, got, I, can't, I can't have an uh... – I, I can't fault anyone for picking either or. I mean, they, they're they both very similar in a lot of aspects, and then they were a little bit different. I mean, I, uh, Marvin was um, supposedly a little quieter on the field, went out there, done his job. Reggie was a little bit more vocal, I think, uh, when, it, when he was out on the field. Uh, both had great work ethics. I mean, Reggie Wayne came in with a hard hat, right? I mean, he was – actually you know drove in wasn't he the one that came in on a dump truck one one time yeah, i think uh different yep yeah yeah so you know and again that's something that the indianapolis colts have brought back into the building this year and hiring him and him agreeing to be the wide receivers coach so uh great move in my opinion by the indianapolis colts on that we're going to go and step behind the quarterback now uh, if there's another position, if there's a position that the Indianapolis Colts have had more success at than the wide receivers and quarterbacks, I think it's actually running back mm -hmm. because the number of names of like all pros, pro bowls, hall of fame players that have played for the Indianapolis Colts is quite long. I'm going to go with Edger and James. Just okay. because of the tenure and the length that he played for the Indianapolis Colts, and that you know, year after year after year, he was guaranteed a thousand yards, ten touchdowns, you know, came in and done his job. But it's hard to leave off guys like Marshall Falk, Eric Dickerson, guys like that as well. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna agree with you on this. So I'm gonna go with Edge, even though you know I.
obviously Eric Dickerson, one of the greatest of all time. Marshall Falk, one of the greatest of all time. And Edge, obviously, receiving his Hall of Fame jacket, what, last year, year ago, two years ago, one of those. But um, I'm going to go with Edge off of the strength of I think he – made his name with the Colts. Not saying the other guys didn't, but when Marshall fought the success that he had with the Rams, that's what everybody kind of remember him uh, from. Just the two Super Bowls, the, the greatest show on turf, you know, that whole team that they had with the St. Louis Rams, even though he had a, you know, a great career as a Colt. Don't get me wrong. I just think he kind of uh, made his Hall of Fame statement when he moved on. Um, but so I'm gonna go with Edge. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. Uh, coming from Miami, they, they had that background of all the good running backs coming out of there. He's lived up to the potential, um, you know, and everything that he brought to the Colts, far as um, chemistry, like in the locker room and 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 having those type of guys around. Edge was one of those first guys to kind of bring that energy, you know, to that locker room to where everybody felt at home, everybody felt equal. Um, team chemistry, all those type things. I mean, I, I heard stories about him uh, used to rent out the entire movie theater just so guys can bring their families and things like that on off days and just chill, relax without being bothered. So he was one of those guys that brought that that in, that whole family aspect uh, to the coach locker room. And I think it's still embedded today from some of the things that he brought. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, one last piece uh outside of the offensive line obviously for the Colts offense and that is the tight end now mm -hmm. when you first think about tight end it kind of you, you your mind at least my mind kind of draws to one specific person but I can't not also think about guys like Jack Doyle for how many years he played uh, what he meant to the team, what he meant on the field, in the locker room, things of that nature. And then, of course, I have a personal favorite um, that made me actually enjoy watching tight ends was an Indianapolis Colt, and that was Ken Dilger, um, a guy uh, who played just as hard-nosed blocking as he did, you know, going out there after he caught the ball and running down the field with it. I loved Ken Dilger, but, I mean, come on. Uh, when it comes to stat wise, none of these guys uh, even shine a light towards Dallas Clark. Am I am I wrong? No, you're not wrong at all. <laughs> uh, Dallas is my guy. Uh, first guy I ever saw that could catch that good without wearing gloves. Um, I'm a, I'm gonna go with Dallas as well. I know Jack Doyle stated his case. Uh, definitely, a, definitely a different style of tight end. Uh, when you try to compare the two with him and Dallas, Dallas obviously played in the golden era. Uh, to where, you know, you got Reggie on one side, you got Stokely inside, you got uh, Marv on the other side. Like, he played in a good era to where defenses – it was hard for defenses to match up, you know, to everybody. I want to say uh, 2005 we had 3,000-yard receivers, Dallas, uh, Reggie uh, – uh, who else was it? Dallas Reggie. I want to say Stokely went for 1,000 in 2005. Stokely, yeah. Uh, I, think, so, I think they all had 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns, actually. Yeah, right? some, something crazy like that. So Dallas kind of benefited from that era, but not to take away from anything that Dallas did uh, just because, I mean, just seeing him on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the one-hand catches on the helmet and – all the different mismatches where it looked like he's walking and he's still running by people. I mean, his route running, the savviness. I mean, Dallas Clark had his own style or his own version to where, you know, he was uh, considered around the league as one of the best tight ends in the league, you know, during this time with the Colts. I mean, he was he was never out of like the top three conversation whenever you mention, you know, tight ends just off of Every year he was getting a thousand yards and you know eight plus touchdowns. So I'm gonna say Dallas just off of the, I guess his presence that he brought to the coach offense. Just his like, hey, we need to know where 44 is at at all times. And that was during a time you was talking about. He's always in the top three, and that was during a time when Dallas had a really good tight end. The Chargers had a really good tight end. Kansas City had a really good tight end. Yeah, I mean there was a lot of good like Hall of Fame tight ends out there right so right absolutely um now we got to talk about the guys who 
opened up holes for the running backs and a block for the quarterback. And let's just talk about tackles. Now, we're not going to go through each individual position, left tackle, right? Just the best tackle on the team. Um, this was actually tougher for me than I wanted to admit. It was between two guys. Um, one was a prominent left tackle during the Manning days. And then the other was a guy who just retired, um, in my opinion, was, I, I think this is a situation where it kind of, Costanzo? Mm -hmm. I actually, yeah. Yeah. because Costanzo played a very long time, played at a very yeah. successful level. And, and I'm the only reason I'm going to go with AC here. And this is the, uh, my honest truth. There was never a time where you went, is AC going to draw a penalty, you know, on a false start or something like that? And there were songs written about the other left tackle who was absolutely amazing, but you were worried, you know, uh, there were games where you were like, please don't, don't false start here. You know, it's so important in this part of the game, but he was a monster out there at left tackle. Uh, who's your pick? Uh, far as the, are we talking left tackle, or just tackle period, just tackle period. Okay. Um, I, I hate to be just, I hate to continue to be biased off guys I played with, but some of the guys I played with are considered some of the best players to play for the Colts. Um, so when you talk about tackles, I mean, like you said, Tariq Glenn, you gotta, you gotta mention him just off of what he did for Peyton as mm -hmm. his, you know, bell cow type guy, but uh, I'm a Ron Dean fan, man. Um, to see him and how he worked and how he went about his business. I mean, that whole O-line during my era with, uh, and I don't want to jump, you know, to the other positions by naming some of these guys, but uh, when you talk about Ron Dim on one side, Jeff Saturday at center, Ron Lidja at guard, and, you know, things like that, we're talking about a solid, solid group of old linemen that, uh, that you can honestly say this, this might be some of the best guys that we had in our, you know, history of, of uh, you know, protecting the quarterback and opening up holes for the run. So uh, I had to choose between him and Ron, and I'm, this will be the first time I'm not going to go with a guy I played with. So I'm going to go with Tariq Glenn and, uh, and and say he's the best tackle that we've seen for the Colts. So you're going with Tariq Glenn over Ryan Dean? I am. I am. Okay. And I will go okay. Ryan Dean second and Costanzo third. And I actually played with Costanzo, I think, for two years when he first got into the league. So uh, seeing his battles with Rob and Free uh, as he kind of got welcomed into the league in those training <laughs> camps and those practices definitely made him a hell of a player going forward in his career. Absolutely. Um, well, shout out to Ryan guy, uh, made the list as well. I thought about him, but it was a, a short, you know, thought. Now you obviously had your time playing with him, watching him on the field, seeing him in the locker room and knows what, what he meant to the team as a whole. So, uh, I'm going to kind of lean on you for, for that one. Uh, <laughs> let's go. Inside, go guards. There's not a question, is there? I mean, they, they've had some pretty darn good guards in the NFL right. uh, for the Indianapolis Colts, but I don't know many that even in the four years that he's only played with the Colts so far, I think he's the best that Quentin Nelson mm -hmm. is the best that they've had at that position. And that's saying a lot considering some of these guards that we've had played a lot longer and has, has had more accolades through their careers. But, I mean, it, it's Big Q, right? Yeah, it's Big Q. Quinn Nelson, man. I mean, he's he's on his way of setting the standard for how to play the guard position for his era. I think if you ask any other team, any other divisional opponent, anybody that see him on a regular basis, I think they will agree with you and say the same. I mean, I mean he's one of one. Uh, one of those guys that you just don't find, uh, you know, every day. Uh, so I'm going to agree with you on that. Quinn Nelson is definitely in his first four years is making his case as like, I'm on my way to get a gold jacket. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the position right in center, maybe the most underrated position I think in football is the center position. Uh, the importance, uh, the connection, I mean, He's the first guy to touch the football every down in the NFL, right? He's the guy. He's he's there 
helping the quarterback set up defenses and making sure the offensive line is 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 right and and all sorts of stuff. I mean, he's he's the glue in the center of that line. Mm-hmm. And you I, the Colts have had some pretty good centers. They got a good center right now in Ryan Kelly. Uh but I mean, come on. Uh those of us who watched the Peyton Manning days, you already named him uh in my opinion. I mean, just Saturday. Uh, he's getting honored this year, right? Uh, getting put up on the ring of honor. I think Jeff Saturday is hands down the best center that the Indianapolis Colts have ever put out there on the field. I'm with you. I agree. I'm talking about an undrafted guy that started from the bottom, worked his way up. I mean, you know, he 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 was the 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 definition of hard work for the Colts. I mean, he was somebody that you looked at that uh, he never made any excuses, always had a positive attitude, and he'd done his job, you know, rather than people thinking he's too small, rather than people thinking that he don't have the ideal size to play center and all those things. He still got the job done and uh, was a tremendous leader for the Colts and still to this day represent the Colts, you know, well in the media and some of the other things that he does. So, you know, uh, and Jeff's a great guy. You know, he's <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen Jeff other than uh, getting mad at Peyton a few times for throwing the ball instead of running. I don't think I've ever seen Jeff, like, upset at anything. So um, I, that was another – that's another player that I was fortunate to play with at a young age in my career uh, just to learn from because, I mean, he was great as a teammate as well. Wow. I would have loved to have been there uh, to see Jeff Saturday have an argument with Peyton Manning over throwing over running. I've been like, you know, Quentin Nelson having arguments with the the GM because, I mean, that's kind of – Peyton Manning held all sorts of positions. <laughs> he did, he did, but when he was player, he made sure he stayed on the player level, if that makes sense. So whenever we were in any type of practice format, game, anything like that, he's player first. So he, he wasn't one that would try to override any coaches in front of the team or – in front of players or do anything like that. So if you didn't really know the inside, you didn't know that Peyton was making a lot of decisions. Uh, and I'm talking players. Like some players don't know what goes on as far as outside of their meeting rooms and things like that. So if you didn't know, you wouldn't know that Peyton was, you know, made the, the itinerary schedule for the Super Bowl or or those type things. So, uh, I mean, he did a good job in uh, making sure that, you know, his role was visible like everybody else's. So. It, it was it was good spirited talks, just like if Antoine Bethea and myself had a good spirited talk on the sideline about a certain coverage or a certain technique or a certain call uh, that we might disagree about. I mean, it happens in football. So with Peyton, though, and Lyman or if it was Peyton and Reggie, those it used to be almost kind of exciting to see because you're just looking at greatness trying to figure it out. And you're just as a young player, you're like, oh, damn, like Reggie and Peyton got into it you know, on the sideline, then they went out there and scored three plays later. So I guess whatever, you know, situation they had, it worked out. (laughs) If I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Jeff Saturday was a representative for the NFLPA as well, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a big, big thing in my opinion. Was he also a guy? uh, Well, um, during your time there, was he one of those, guys that was the the mediator like between the coaches gm and the players like you know when the the coaches and players need to get a feel for the player or coaches and gm need to get a feel for the players he would be the guy that the players would be like go talk to him go go talk to these guys about this situation or something no, nah, normally every team just got leadership guys already in place. So if you if you're a part of the core of the team, you're probably talking to coaches, the GM on a normal basis. Uh, and I, when I say normal basis, not like you're doing anything to where it's like a formatted meeting or anything like that. But whenever you cross paths in the organization, of course, you're going to have conversations and see how everybody feels and things like that. And, and, and Jeff Saturday, just like Peyton, just like Rob, just like Freeney, was considered one of those core pieces. So if he felt like he needed to go to management to talk about anything that the team might need, he would do that. But I say that to say those guys, you know, everybody had, everybody during my time always was kind of on the same page. So it was never, I mean, Polian used to ask me what I felt about things and I was a rookie. 
you know, so I'm, I, they did a good job in making everybody kind of feel important, especially if you had a role uh, during that course of the season. All right, let's flip. Let's go to the defense now. Well, we spent quite a bit of time on the offense. I want to go to the defense. We're going to go from the backside to the front. And the first position on the backside is the safety. And I might have a little bit of a surprise for those of you watching and listening because, look, I love Bob Sanders as much as everybody. And I know he's going to be on the top of a lot of people's lists. And when he was on the field, he was dynamic, game-changing, I mean, every word that you could put out there, he definitely was, but he had injury problems, right? And he yeah. didn't play a whole lot. Uh, when he was out there, he was great, but he didn't play a whole lot. In my opinion, the best safety the Colts have ever had is Antoine Bethea, the guy who's been out there. He was, he was, it didn't matter if he had a broken hand and he was playing with a club, you know, he was out there, he produced, he was that safety blanket back there on the back end of the defense. That was my favorite safety for the Indianapolis Colts. Who was yours? I agree. Antoine Bethea, my guy, he is, uh, I think he's number one on the Colts list. He will definitely be in the ring of honor one day and uh, got a resume for a Hall of Fame. Never know when it'll happen, but I definitely think he has a resume to get in the Hall um, but I definitely had my guy Swan and I had Mike Adams as my top two safeties um, for the Colts. I think Mike Adams, when he came, I thought it was a tremendous signing. I thought he fit exactly what the Colts needed. Uh, and when you talk about leadership and, you know, things like that, Mike Adams was the face of it. And uh, he did a good job in his play and established himself as one of the, the leaders of that defense and ended up having a great career uh, as a coach as well. So my two even though, like you said, a lot of people put Bob in there. He did miss a lot of time, and but when he was out there, he was great, and he's a former defensive MVP, so it's kind of almost blasphemous for not having him. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, but I think uh, Antoine and Mike uh, did a good job in representing the, the coach safety position, how it should be represented. Pops was really big with coming in immediately and taking on a leadership role, was he not? Yes, he was. He was. And that's what I mean. He came in immediately, and it was almost like he had been there before. And like he came in, fit right in, jailed in, played well, uh, got the fan got the fan base going around him, the whole thing. Like it wasn't like it was a buildup with Mike. It seemed like he jumped in and had everything kind of figured out immediately as far as his style of play, what he was bringing to the coach, his leadership roles and all those things. Uh, so when he came, uh, it kind of complimented Antoine. When Antoine left, it kind of gave you that, I guess, that reminder of uh, the leadership and uh, those type of things that, that comes with the defense. So as we move up, we're going to go with the cornerbacks. And I'm going to name two. All right, I'll name one, you name one, I'll name one, you name one. All right. Uh, but there's a, the Colts have had some pretty darn good cornerbacks in the NFL uh in, in their time here. And man, I love you. I'm glad that you but uh please don't take offense if I don't put your name on this list, okay? <laughs> um but look, I've been a Colts fan for a very, very long time. And the Colts have had good corners going all the way back into the 80s. And my top cornerback was actually a cornerback and a safety, but I love big play Ray as a cornerback. I'm going to go with Ray Buchanan as my top pick. I had, uh, I had, Ray, I had Ray on my list as well. All right. All right. Uh, so that that's who I got as my number one corner. Uh, who you got as your number one corner? I got um... – I thought about this for a while, and it's going to be some Colt fans that's going to get mad at me about this. But when the guy did come for about a three-year stretch, he did a great job in taking out number one receivers and playing at a high level, being making Pro Bowl and doing all that. It didn't end well with the Colts. But when he was playing and he was healthy, he was one of the best corners in the league during this stretch, and I'm going to say Vontae Davis as my number one and i know Colt, i know the Colt fan base probably is still kind of pissed off at Vontae and how everything went down when he quit but at that same token when things were going great those three years man i mean 
he did what he was supposed to do. I mean, they traded for him, gave up a second round pick, I think, for him. So he had a lot of pressure on him. I was there with him that that first year he came. And uh, I thought I thought he lived up, you know, to most of the expectations that he had when he first got traded to. And then, you know, obviously he signs a deal and things kind of change a little bit later. But for those about three years, that that stretch, I thought I thought they handled his business like he was supposed to. Absolutely. Um, uh, there was other names, obviously. Uh, you got Marlon Jackson, you got Hayden, you know, uh, Kelvin, my guy. Yep. yeah, yeah. Um, you've even got, look, you got Vonte is a fantastic player and I had a hard time not naming him my number two. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'm with you. Uh, during his time that he played with the Colts, he was absolutely fantastic shutdown. Um, and man, it was it was difficult. It, it's not how he left the, the game that has. Right. Uh, he's a player, right? He's he, he's a person too, and he was just fed up with it. He was done. He was like, well, you know, at this point, uh, no point in me playing no more. I don't want to play anymore, and he was done. And I can't fault the guy. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that uh, walked out of a job, you know, at lunchtime, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm it sure. happens. Lunchtime, it happens. <laughs> it happens. It happens. All right. Um, especially you get fed up with something, whether it's, you know, the uh, the organization you work for, your own personal, you know, performance, whatever it is, you know, people do it all the time. Um I'm going to go with a guy who I think his best work is still ahead of him. And he's still on the Colts right now for number two. And he's, yes, he's, he's, he's only a nickel back, but at the same time, he plays a lot of outside. He does do a good job. He doesn't just cover. He also blitzes. He he runs down running backs and tackle. He does everything out there on the field that you can ask a guy to do. And yes, I understand that he's in the middle of contract negotiations and it's been made public. But I, I think Kenny Moore deserves to be on this list because he has played. As you, you talked about Jeff Saturday, undrafted free agent. Well, Kenny Moore was an undrafted free agent, came in has played his butt off and I really like what he has done since he's been with the Colts and I hope he continues to stay because I think I think the sky's the limit for the for the guy yeah and I agree with you on that I'll go with uh Kenny Moore as well just off of the start of his career and uh the things that he's been doing and the pace that he's on uh as far as trajectory uh, going forward, you you would think that he's just going to continue to get better and better and make more plays. Uh, he's mm-hmm. definitely brought an element to the coach defense that we haven't seen in the past. I mean, normally we're zone. Uh, everybody eyes is on the quarterback. Nobody's really doing nothing that's too fancy or too crazy. I'm talking pass, pass. I ain't talking about like the past few years. But now he's like this dynamic defensive player in the secondary that you can kind of move around and play with. He kind of gives you some of those – honey badger instincts, those honey badger um, uh, style of play to where they kind of just, you just got to know where 23 is at. You know, every time you line up, you got to point him out to know where he's at on the field uh, because he can change a game. So I'm going to agree with you on that just because of his playmaking ability and ability to change a game from a, a defensive perspective. And like you said, undrafted guy, got it out the mud, started at the bottom and now considered the best nickel corner in the league for not just coming into this year, but the past few years, he's made an argument for being the best nickel back in the league. And it's hard to stay at the top once you get to the top. So I figured that he's going to stay at the top. And the only way that you stay at the top is you continue to make plays. And that's what we need Kenny Moe to do. Absolutely. A lot of names left on off this list, uh, including uh one of our friends, right? More more of a friend to you than me, uh, but I, I'd like to consider him a friend. Um, over there on the man-to-man pod, he was a great mm-hmm. cornerback for the Indianapolis Colts during his time too, right? So, uh, yep, absolutely. Darius, don't be mad that we left you off this list, <laughs> but we did give you an honorable mention. Um, 
Moving on. Now, linebackers are a tricky thing. Uh, it's it's dip, It's kind of like talking about cornerbacks and nickelbacks, mm-hmm. where, you know, difference between an, uh, a nickel cornerback and an outside cornerback. Well, linebackers, you got the pass rushing linebackers, and then you got your off-ball linebackers. We're going to just place pass rushers in with pass rushers. Gotcha. All right. That's what I would like to do. Uh, whether you're a defensive end pass rusher or an outside linebacker pass rusher, either way, you're a pass rusher. So we're going to talk off ball linebackers. Um, generally, they're your inside linebackers, but you know, when you're talking about uh, a 3 4. Um, in my opinion, a lot of good good names on this list. Uh, Jeff Harrod, uh, shout out to him. Gary Brackett was a great one as well. Uh, I thought Jarrell Freeman played absolutely fantastic out there. Uh, but I, I, I got to give my guy Darius Leonard. Uh, he's, he's, he's an off ball linebacker, not in the same style of the, as the previous guys that we, that I, I just listed, but, uh, he's still that guy who goes out there and just every year game after game is someone that you absolutely have to know exactly where he is on the field. Uh, how about yourself? I think I'm going to go with Gary. Um, I'm going to go with just Gary. I mean, you got another undrafted guy, another guy where the odds was kind of stacked against him and he made a name for himself to the point to where he was never considered like one of the best linebackers in the league. I mean, obviously during this time, middle linebacker was, you know, stack across the league. Every team had like a great middle linebacker during during his era. But what he brought to the Colts outside of leadership and his playmaking ability was Gary was one of those guys to where every big game he was going to make a play. And I think it was almost expected for him to make a play. And I joke with him all the time about, you know, that Steelers AFC, I want to say it's AFC championship in Indy uh, when Gary hit Jerome Bettis and made him fumble and uh, – uh, what's my guy named the cornerback? Everybody they used to blast me for him cutting back because I wore 25 to Nick Harper. Nick Harper. gets it and tries to cut back, and Ben Rosenberger trips him up. If he just stays on the sideline, he wins. We go to the Super Bowl. But I say that to say, if that play changes to where the Colts win that game, Gary's legacy as a Colt, you know, would be totally different. And I'm talking this somebody that had won a Super Bowl as a starting linebacker. Uh, when they beat him and went to the Super Bowl again, uh, when we got beat by the uh, by the Saints, so I just feel like, man, if if that play right there sends the Colts to the Super Bowl, his legacy, just far as how people look at him, would be so much uh, greater than what it is now and all the accomplishments that he received now. Uh, so I'm gonna go with Gary just off of what I saw from him and uh, playmaking ability. Uh, don't I don't think that Gary is a better playmaker than Darius Leonard. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what Gary brought to the team during that era, uh, to where the coach was considered one of the best teams in football during that time. Another name that uh, I hadn't mentioned that I will feel awful if I don't at least mention his name because. The time that he played for the Indianapolis Colts was, you know, I mean, he made the Pro Bowl, uh, was an absolute stud out there at linebacker. Dequell Jackson was fantastic mm-hmm. and definitely deserves mention on this list. Cato uh, June as well. Cato June, there you go. Uh, lots, lots of great linebackers that the Indianapolis Colts have had. Uh, now we're going to go, we're going to go inside defensive linemen. Uh, I know that we're going to. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind. Of, I should have went outside because of the pass rusher thing with the. But I, I want to leave the pass rushers for last. Um, well, not last, last because we still got kicker punter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, inside defensive linemen. Um, we've had a few. There's there's some really good ones out there. Um, uh, Corey Redding. Uh, yeah, Corey. the goose. Uh, we, uh, obviously we got divorced Buckner right now. Uh, and, and there's been a few of them out there. I'm going to ask you, who's your top dog? Uh, it's a hard one, man. Um, it's, it's been one of those positions for the coach in the past to where, even though it's been important, I don't think we've had, 
you know, that that one guy that and set the standard kind of like how we've talked about the other positions. So I'm not sure on this one. I mean, um, I was thinking hard and long and couldn't just give God like I played with Corey and he brought, you know, a great presence to our team and all that. But I wouldn't say that, you know, during that time, even Corey was the best D lineman on our team. Uh, and I love Corey. Don't get me wrong. He was great. But I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. What about you? Again, um, there's been some names. Uh, like, like I already named off Redding. I, I, who right. who did you think was uh, – I hate to ask. Was you, was you a Raheem Brock guy? Yeah, I played with, play with Raheem. But when I played with Raheem, even though he played inside a little bit, he was – more of more. a defensive end as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put him in there. Uh, Mookie Johnson was there when I, I was there. Um, I just went blank dead and trying to think of some of the other guys. And that's, that's what I mean. Rager. Like, who was that? Monte Rager. I don't think Monte was there when I was there, when I played. Okay. Um, Ricky Jean. No. Nah. Ah. That's what I'm saying. It, no, no, nobody just pops up. Uh, Eric Foster was there when I was there. Um, I, I I can't think. I can't think. Somebody's gonna be mad at me about this too, because I know <laughs> somebody, they're gonna be pissed off about me. But yeah, I I can't remember anybody just standing out that's been that's been the type of player at the defensive tackle position to where you was just like, oh man, this guy is the guy or whatnot. Even though we've had some good players. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about? Daryl Reed. I Darryl think Daryl 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 Reed, yeah. Reed was Darryl, a, but yeah, Daryl Reed used to knock people out on special teams all the time too. So yeah, that's yeah. now I would I would put DeForest Buckner's my my favorite player yeah. uh on the Colts defense right now, but I can't name him number because he's only been with the Colts for two for, for just a couple years, yeah. right? Right. Uh I am going to list Daryl Reed. Because of what he was able to do, exactly what you just said, you know, he, his, his special teams um, ability, even though he was a defensive tackle, what he did on special teams was absolutely fantastic. It was game changing at times, right? Yeah. Uh, just I, he was able to get the ball back at times because of the his ability to just make huge monstrous hits. Or, or the defense would come out on a high, you know, going, oh, heck, we got to ride this this emotion, right, that that uh, he provided on the field. So I am actually, and I know people are going to get mad at me because of Goop, but l- let's face it, all right, I love Tony Saragusa. Uh, rest in peace, my guy. But he made more of a name for himself with the Ravens, Ravens. than he did with the Colts. So, um. Let's go to the outside pass rushers. Mm-hmm. All right. That's look, it's it's a it's a two man battle and they played side by side. I, I it it is. Uh are you you agree with me, right? I agree. Yeah. Bro, okay, agree. okay. Yeah. Freeney and Mathis. Uh it, it's it's you can't go wrong with either, in my opinion. Um uh both guys were absolutely fantastic. And studs, but I have to lean Robert Mathis here because he played his entire career with the Indianapolis Colts and is the Colts' all-time sack leader. Um, uh, he was uh, absolute fantastic at what he did. Um, now I have a Dwight Freeney jersey that survived my house fire somehow, um, but my Robert Mathis jersey didn't. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna have to find a way of getting one of those, uh, somehow, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm gonna put Robert Mathis number one, just because of the, the length and tenure that he was, and he still follows the Colts. He still helps the Colts. He's still out there, uh, you know, putting out his opinions on stuff with the Indianapolis Colts on a daily basis on social media. So mm-hmm. I'm going, yeah. I'm going with Robert Mathis here. Yeah, I'm going to go with Rob as well, uh, just off of the style I prefer. I thought uh, Freeney was great. I thought if you tried to compare the two, I think I think most people would say Freeney was more finesse. You know, he was he had the spin move. He had the 
the speed. He had different maneuvers and different ways of getting to the quarterback without having to be too physical. I think Rob was more so of the hard worker. Of course, he had, you know, skill moves and those things as well, but everybody considered him undersized uh, and all those things. And, um, and I thought he overcame a lot, you know, coming from an HBCU and, you know, the expectations wasn't, you know, um, the same as it was for somebody like Freeney, who was a first round draft pick. Uh, and I think Rob proved himself. I think every year that he played, every game that he played, he felt like he had to prove himself. And, uh, and I thought that's what, kind of got him the success that he got just having that chip on him shoulder having that shoulder day in and day out and that's my my style my type of player my type of guy uh, so I'm definitely going to go with Rob as the 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 best pass rusher to grace the Colts facility and again um there are good pass rushers that the Colts have had in the past uh but the, this mountain has a two peak and you know uh, so if you played for the Indianapolis Colts and were a pass rusher and thought that, you know, well, this ain't fair, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, it is what it is. Um, but we got a couple positions left that we still have to talk about kicker, uh, place kicker and punter. Um, now the Colts have been blessed with special teams kickers throughout their entire franchise. Uh, they've had lots of great kickers. Uh, start back in the day when I was, you know, Dean Biasucci, great place kicker, right? Uh, the the place kicker that we, I that shall not be named because, uh, you know, he talked smack about Peyton Manning. Uh, but he was still a great, yeah, I, he was still a great kicker. I think he was the most accurate kicker in NFL history during his time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how do you not put Hall of Fame, all-time highest scoring player in NFL history, Adam Vinatieri, not number one? No, nah, yeah, he's definitely won. I'm going to go with Adam as well. Um, you know, even though he won the Patriots a couple Super Bowls, I'm going to still put him up there. Uh, I'm not going to yeah. not gonna hold it against him. Uh, I mean, but it's obvious. His resume, I mean, he was kicking dang field goals when I was in second grade. And, uh, you know, and I had the opportunity to play with him. So that just lets you know the hard work, the longevity, uh, the de determination, the, the, you know, the psych, everything uh, that went into him just being able to get on the field. Because uh, you got to think over time, your leg gets worn out just like a pitcher over time. Orm gets worn out for throwing the ball every day. Uh, so to see Adam uh, break all those records, become the all-time NFL leading scorer and all those things, I mean, it was way more deserving than even what it was. So uh, I'm going to definitely put him as one. Uh, he's a GOAT. He's, he's going to get a statue at some point. Uh, I don't know, award. You know, like they do the the Ray Guy punt, punter award. I, I feel like Vinny will have his own award of, of some sort at some point when it comes to either college football or the NFL. Yeah, that should, that should be something, uh, most definitely. We're going to come to the punter now. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna have a lot of Colts fans ticked off at me. I'm oh, probably if it, if, if it ain't who I think it is, yeah, you definitely yeah. gonna have some people pissed off. Uh huh. Uh, look, um, the Colts have had a lot of great punters as well. Um, a lot. Uh, there's 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 a few of them right all all the way down the line, and I know 99% of people out there. Are, it would pick Pat McAfee. Um, no, question. no question about it. Just what he was able to do on the field, multiple different ways, right? Uh, put his body out on the line to stop guys. Um, was able to re recover his own kickoffs, uh, <laughs> onside kicks, and he had the personality. I had a difficult time. Believe it or not, because when I think of place kickers, I don't think my mind don't first go to Pat McAfee. My mind goes first to Ron Stark, but I've watched the Colts for a long time. 
right? And Ron Stark was the first punter that I actually watched on a field and go, how did he do that? Hmm. How did he do that? Ron Stark was an amazing punter. And it was very different. Those were the two guys that were right there was those two guys, Pat McAfee and Ron Stark with me. Um, and I cannot, and, and I understand that y'all are going to be like, how can you not? But I can't choose between the two. To me, it's a tie just because, uh, I guess it's personal bias of, of what I grew up watching uh, when I was younger that made me actually appreciate the actual skill of punting footballs. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with you and your reasons for that. I'm not gonna, but the one reason I will put Pat McAfee over him is Pat McAfee arguably might be our our uh, best backup quarterback we've ever had. Uh, when I was with the coach at one point, I think he was our third team backup, and I think he was damn near about to get in a game at one point because somebody had got hurt. And uh, so for the fact that an organization would think that a punter has a well enough arm and an equipped mind to get behind a center on a professional level and be the quarterback, which Pat used to joke about it all the time and used to act like he was really ready. Uh, I mean, even warmed up in warm ups with the quarterback sometimes. I mean, he was just a freakish athlete. I mean, I seen the guy punt a ball 75 yards, you know, 80 yards, just some of the things he used to do in practice, you know, just playing around. And, uh, you know, he used to kick field goals in practice as well. Uh, I remember at one point him and Benny had to have a conversation about it uh, just because Pat had like this damn strong leg and he would just line up and hit 65 yard or 68 yard. Like it's nothing, you know, like, like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to be the, the first person to do both, you know, for over a period of time. And uh, Benny was like, hold up, man. Like, I, this is my damn job, you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> at practice, they're going to, you know, get rid of me. Uh, type thing. But, um, you know, Pat was just a hell of an athlete. And I thought, I thought he changed as far as how people viewed kickers and punters. You know, you view them a certain way as if they're not, you know, part of the team or whatever. People say that. Uh, I think Pat kind of changed that narrative with some of the playmaking abilities he was able to do from that position. I mean, it was just skillful to watch. I mean, so fun to see him do certain things with the football, whether it's making big tackles on the sideline, like you said, kicking it to himself, or pinning somebody down on the one-yard line off of a 65-yard punt, you know, or something like that. So I just thought that he kind of changed the narrative during his time when he played on how people viewed uh, that, that certain position. Yeah, there was, I mean, I think Pat McAfee was one of two punters that actually like was leading headlines for a while in the NFL. Right. Him, him and Marquette King, uh, the punter for the Raiders, you know, uh, both of those guys, you know, were, were, were giving uh, a lot of attention for the brand. Uh, so, um, yeah, definitely. I, and, and I get the argument with, it's just personal bias of what actually got me into really loving, uh, watching and, 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 and going, well, great. We got to kick the ball off and not even watch the special teams unit, you know, when I right. was younger until, until, uh, Ron Stark, until I actually watched Ron Stark punt. And I'm just like, wow, he's really good at dropping people inside the five yard line or, you know, out of bounds at the two, you know, or something like that, which Pat McAfee was really great at too, you know? Right. So, well, that's our list. Uh, is there anything else you want to, you want to talk about or. or... No, nah, man, that was it. That was good. Some good yeah, stuff. Yeah, it was, it was very good stuff. And we weren't a hundred percent the same all across the board. I mean, we obviously, we had some that we were, uh, but they were no brainers. I mean, right, right. Um, so those of you listening or watching, what do you think? Drop in the comments. Let us know. Uh, would there be something that you would change with your list? Well, I think that's going to do it for Gerard Powers and myself uh, for this podcast. Thanks for watching. If you're listening, please don't forget to download. If you're uh, watching this on YouTube, smash that like button and share to your favorite social media. 
This was Believe in Colts brought to you by Bet Online. I'm Lawrence Owen. That's Gerard Powers. And until next time, as usual, go Colts. Colts.